Well, thank you very much for joining us for today's Cardiac College online session. Here you'll see the upcoming uh, talks uh, devoted to diabetes over the next couple of uh, sessions. Today, we will be talking about how your heart works. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you again. My name is Paul O. Oh. I'm the medical director in the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Rehab Program at the University Health Network. A reminder about these sessions that they are really focused on education uh, as, as a primary imperative. And we would ask you to check in with your healthcare provider for specific advice about your own situation. We do, however, invite, invite in questions and uh, really enjoy that as part of these educational endeavors. So in the Zoom platform, if you'll go to the bottom part of the menu, click on Q&A and type in your questions as they occur uh, throughout this uh, 30 to 40 minutes. That will be great. And we can spend some time at the end going over those uh, specific uh, items that are on your mind. By the end of this particular session about the heart, you will know how a healthy heart works. And we'll, we'll talk about the four main systems of the heart, including a blood supply, electrical system, the valves, and how the heart muscle works as a pump. Importantly, we'll also talk about what can go wrong with these systems in the heart, and then which interventions are currently used commonly to try to correct these problems. You may find that your own situation will then be reflected as we go through uh, this discussion, whether your heart is perfectly healthy or whether you've gone through some events, procedures, surgeries. Let's start off the discussion by uh, reflecting on what the heart really does. And if we think of the heart as a large muscle about the size of a fist that is in the center to left part of your chest, it is a muscle whose primary function is to pump blood around the body. And each heartbeat that goes from the left side of the heart through uh, the, uh, the body's systems will send oxygen rich blood around the body and oxygen of course is required for normally function normal functioning of all of our organ systems and all of the cells throughout the body if we look more closely at how the heart works and the anatomic structure of the heart again we're representing the heart as this large organ in the middle of your uh, chest to the left side <clears throat> it is surrounded by these two large pillows that are the uh, right lung and the left lung, respectively. The right side of the heart consists of an upper chamber called an atrium, and then a lower chamber called the ventricle. The right ventricle pushes blood out into the pulmonary or lung circulation. Uh, it's denoted as blue here because when the right side uh, of the heart sends blood out, it is in an unoxygenated form. When the blood transits through the lung tissues and down to these little capillaries and alveoli of the lungs, that's where transfer of oxygen occurs. Oxygen is picked up um, and returned to the left side of the heart into the left atrium to the left ventricle. And then that is what is pushed out through the large blood vessel systems of the body. And this is how oxygen delivery occurs. So we need all of this to be working properly, the, the circuits to be connected appropriately, uh, blood to be ejecting appropriately so that we can have this pickup and transfer of oxygen uh, for the rest of the body. To make this happen in a smoothly coordinated fashion, we have a number of systems within the heart that need to work in concert. And the heart is, is very analogous to the systems that might make up our house or our uh, other sort of uh, living dwellings. That if our houses are working well, then we've got windows and doors and, and walls with a roof an electrical system, a plumbing system, and all of these things need to work particularly well so that our hearts function, or so that our homes function. So the heart is, the, is very much the same way. So the major systems within the heart include a blood supply, that's like our plumbing, 
an electrical system that is like the electrical wiring through the house, valves, which function like doors that separate the rooms of our house, and the muscle and pump, uh, which is like the walls of our house that need to be strong and integral to, to push things around. When these systems go awry, then when they go off, then that is when we develop conditions that we'll collectively call heart disease. But each kind of domain will have its own unique conditions of so-called disease. Some people think of heart disease as really primarily representing diseases of the plumbing or blood supply, uh, noted as coronary artery disease. But some of us may have entered into our rehab programs or uh, experienced healthcare encounters related to other kinds of heart disease, such as arrhythmia, or problems of the electrical system of the heart, valvular heart disease, or problems of those doors and windows that separate our chambers. And some people may have actually experienced a, a condition called cardiomyopathy or a heart muscle problem or heart failure might be another term for it. So it's important to think about um, which of these conditions might be affecting you and then what uh, has gone right or what's gone wrong, and then what are the interventions that, that can help deal with this. So let's go through these in turn. We'll start with coronary artery disease or diseases of the plumbing. And again, plumbing we think of because the coronary arteries are these blood vessels that supply oxygen-rich blood to the pumping muscle. We have a number of coronary arteries. The major ones include the one on the right side, which is called the right coronary artery. And then there is one large one on the left called the left main coronary artery that splits into a number of other major blood vessels, including this one on the front of the heart that goes from the top to the bottom. So this one is called the left anterior because that's front and from top to bottom means descending. So, so left anterior descending artery. And then there's another uh, major tributary off the left side that wraps around the side of the heart. So it's kind of circular and that's called the circumflex artery, <clears throat> excuse me. So in any one of these arteries that are either the main vessels or the smaller tributaries, there can be buildup of plaque over the course of years, to decades, and that, that's what this cross section is representing. So in a stylized way, this may represent our artery when we are a teenager. So wide open, very smooth blood cells can travel through the entire diameter of that artery. At the age of 30, say, we may start to develop these early plaques, the buildup of atherosclerosis in the wall of the artery. You know, this is not restricting to blood flow at this point, but there is an early sign that there is atherosclerosis going on. At the age of 50 or 60 or 70, we may have a very dramatic buildup of plaque or atherosclerosis that's going on. It may be sufficient to start to limit the amount of blood flow that can happen, and that may manifest as symptoms. And then later on, there may be actually be a rupture event that happens, a crack, a break, a, an earthquake, a volcano eruption. Any of those terms can, or, or thoughts, uh, images can come to mind where there's actually complete blockade of the artery. There is no more blood flowing, and that's what denotes a heart attack. As we said, when there is an intermediate level of blockage, then we may be experiencing that as a syndrome called angina or chest pain or heart-related pain that tends to happen in the center to left side of the chest. But there is a lot of variability on this, especially for women. And um, some people may experience only discomfort that goes down the arm or discomfort up into the neck or discomfort that's experienced in the back. Some people don't have any discomfort at all and it just may be felt as shortness of breath or fatigue or uh, other people may experience this as just, you know, I can't sleep particularly well because something is wrong. All of these may be subtle signs of coronary artery disease that's reached a 
uh, point where there is a restriction of blood flow, and then that's what might bring us to attention. We might have a stress test, we might have an angiogram that will then identify a blockage uh, that needs something further done. If we have these sorts of coronary artery disease problems or plumbing problems or blood supply problems, what can we do? Uh, again, uh, we've seen a slide like this when we talked about medicines of when a plaque goes bad with that atherosclerotic plaque that builds up, uh, you know, the wall of, or the diameter of this artery is meant to be all the way to the outside of this circle, but clearly we've got lots of bad stuff going on with the plaque, with the rupture, with the thrombus, with a dysfunctional lining of that artery. This has lots of bad things going on, so we need to do something about it. And unfortunately, there are many things that we can do about this. You know, it starts with, uh, quote, lifestyle approaches. You know, I don't know if it's really lifestyle as the appropriate uh, sort of terminology, but there are certainly things that are in our control uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that can help us out with this. Um, and we come back to the construct, the foundations of our whole education and rehabilitation program with you uh, that has five major pillars to it. So how can we help coronary artery disease? Well, we can start by understanding and treating our own condition. We can get active. We can eat healthy. We can manage our psychological health and feel well. And in the middle, take control of our own health. And all of these steps go a long way towards improving coronary artery disease from the quotation mark lifestyle uh, uh, approach. We can also offer up a number of medications that address different parts of coronary artery uh, problems. And we, in our medication sessions that we might have experienced live or you might have watched uh, in terms of video uh, on your own, uh, we'll remind you that medicines like aspirin and other antiplatelet drugs like clopidogrel and ticagrelor or prazogrel really affect this uh, middle part here where blood is trying to stick, platelets are trying to stick, we can help keep them apart and blood flowing much more easily by using these sorts of medicines. We can think of beta blocker drugs uh, as ways of relaxing the heart, relaxing the blood vessels, reducing um, blood pressure, reducing stress in the system. And that's where beta blockers or those LOL drugs come in. Um, the statin medications, as well as other uh, medicines that help work on cholesterol can substantially reduce the amount of this plaque, as well as the quality of this plaque to make it much more stable. So those are the statin drugs and ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers can work on the lining cells or the endothelium of the, uh, of the artery to relax it, reduce stress, reduce blood pressure. And all of these medicines individually and in combination have been shown to reduce the risk of bad things happening in the setting of coronary artery disease, such as heart attack and stroke and death. So medicines certainly have an approach as well on top of or in conjunction with all of those good quotation mark lifestyle interventions. We can also do other things from an interventional perspective if there is coronary artery disease present. And, and maybe a third of you who are watching this session might have undergone a percutaneous coronary intervention, or another term for this might be a coronary angioplasty. Percutaneous means we go through the skin uh, underneath, say with a catheter that is uh, fed through from the groin into the femoral artery, or a catheter that might go into one of the arteries in the wrist or the arm. The catheter is, is passed upwards until it reaches the heart, and it, it uh, actually goes down into one of the blood vessels. The, the coronary part of this is that we get into a coronary artery, and then there is a, 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 an intervention done to a blockage that is inside that artery. So an angioplasty refers to changing the shape and structure of that artery. Intervention means we've done a procedure to that artery. And typically a balloon is passed uh, over a wire uh, to that site of blockage. The balloon is inflated from the inside out so that there is 
um, expansion that happens. Um, and then that is the way that we can open up that blockage. Um, there are some nice videos that are available at, at the American Heart Association <clears throat> Interactive Cardiovascular Library. And you can see actually a nice animation of how a wire, a balloon, a catheter can be uh, placed at the point of a blockage. The balloon can be inflated and expanded. And then a secondary balloon with a metal stent can be placed in that area. And then the stent is left behind to keep that artery nice and open. And, and here's a, a more colorful graphic of how that is done. And you can appreciate how the atherosclerotic plaque is kind of squashed into the wall. The stent is propping everything open. So it's a nice technical and procedural and structural intervention. Uh, but a, a, an image like this reminds us that the stent by itself is not the solution here entirely, that we need to continue to think about eating well and moving more and managing our mental stresses, as well as using medications judiciously to prevent clotting from happening in the stent, to address the atherosclerotic plaque that is underlying here, uh, using medicines like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors to reduce stress in the walls of this artery to really keep us healthy. So that all of that works in concert. Now, some people may not be great candidates for having a stenting procedure. So there is still a role for bypass operations, especially if these narrowings um, occur in multiple places throughout the heart, occur in multiple vessels in, 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 in the heart, or that if the blockages are long and kind of twisty where putting in a, a, a a catheter and a balloon and a stent may just not be technically the most easy thing to do. So uh, th some people or many people still undergo coronary artery bypass operations where a blockage might, area blockage might be identified. And the bypass part is that there is a blood vessel that is uh, attached uh, upstream to um, uh, a place like the aorta where there is good strong blood flow and then blood is rooted through this bypass down to a place in the artery where there is very good flow afterwards. So uh, we don't necessarily touch this area of blockage, but there is just a new conduit or a new route for blood flow to happen. And the blood vessels that are used for these kinds of bypasses may involve uh, saphenous veins that are taken from the veins from the leg. Um, you know, the, the, a good section of it is, is uh, pulled apart, um, sewn up and, and made into a very nice bypass. And here you see that there is a, a place where it is patched into the aorta and then patched into the section of the coronary artery, in this case, the right coronary artery, after that blockage. On the left side, kind of the modern bypasses will involve, instead of using a vein graft, if possible, using an internal mammary artery. So this is an artery that typically supplies blood to the inner wall of the chest. Instead, this artery can be rerouted uh, and placed into the left uh, internal or left anterior descending artery uh, as a very strong and long, um, uh, long, uh, long lasting type of bypass. And uh, often there is a mix of the two with other veins and maybe even an artery that's taken from the wrist as well. These are the modern approaches to coronary artery bypasses. Okay, so if we've got plumbing problems, blood vessel problems, these are the approaches that are taken. Moving on to the next section, um, what if we've got an electrical problem? And a reminder that there is a electrical system in our hearts that allow uh, the beating of the heart to occur in a nice coordinated fashion. Think of it again, like the electrical system that's in your heart. Uh, in the house. So there is a fuse box that might be in the basement or in the closet. Um, the fuse box 
will have received electrical signals and generate them, transit them through maybe a secondary junction, and then it passes through the major electrical cables uh, of the house. There is a major electrical bundle that ride, runs through the right side of the heart. There is another major bundle uh, that divides and supplies the left side of the heart. You know, the left side is the bigger button, bigger chamber, so it gets two major electrical cables um, uh, to supply it. So uh, th this, when it functions, functions very well and allows nice coordination from the upper chamber to the lower chamber in a nice coordinated way. But over time, there may be wear and tear and uh, kind of fading of, of the electrical system. You know, think of the electrical wires in your house. If the wires are 50 or 60 or 70 years old in your house, you might anticipate that there are some problems or maybe some knob and tube kind of wiring. Maybe some rats have gotten in and chewed some of those wires. Maybe there's short circuits that have occurred. And if that happens, then we may need some help with those electrical wires. And we may be seeing that the electricity is having a bit of difficulty. So we may experience different types of irregular heartbeats that may go too slow or too fast as different pacemakers wind down or speed up. We may see that there's areas of heart block where the electrical signals are not transiting through the electrical cables appropriately. We may see particular rhythms that get more common as we get older. Uh, there's a condition called atrial, the upper chamber, going into fibrillation. So instead of one nice regular pacemaker that drives everything, there may be a whole bunch of pacemakers that start to fire and quiver and compete with each other very quickly. Um, and that irregular kind of heartbeat may be too fast. It may uh, not allow for very good blood flow through the heart and out to the body. And it may carry some other unique risks like developing blood clots in the heart that can break off and land in our brains and cause strokes. So these are important conditions to recognize if we feel irregularity in our heartbeats, or if we feel that we're just not, um, we, if we don't have the, the get up and go that we might usually have, then heartbeat issues might be something that we look at. And then it is not uncommon to experience irregular or skipped heartbeats as well. Some are quite benign, that is, they just skip occasionally and nothing needs to be done about them. Uh, there are other kinds of skipped or regular beats that denote something more sinister going on and they might need some attention. So uh, if you want to know more about irregularity of heartbeats, please watch the session uh, about irregular heartbeats in the Cardiac College online library. Uh, we've done a recent session that, that will take you through that. Um, but for today's session, let's just talk about a couple ways of approaching irregular heartbeats. And in particular, when the heartbeats go too slow, what might we do if our electrical systems are wearing out? Um, and in that situation, you will see your doctor. You may have a tape recording done of your heart called a Holter monitor. If they document that the heart is going very slow or even stopping on occasion for a few seconds, well, that says we need some kind of external backup system. And good news is that there are ways of doing this with these electrical pacemakers. A pacemaker is a device with a, um, a battery and a mini computer about this big. Uh, it's typically implanted in the left upper chest, but it may go in the right upper chest or it may go into the belly as well. Typically there are wires then that will be thread um, from that battery and mini computer down to the heart. And there may be one wire or more uh, that will go into typically the right side of the heart. The uh, wire is called also a lead that will detect the ECG signals and it reads them all the time. And if it says, oh, you have lost one, you've lost two, then it has the ability to feed back to the computer and tell it to deliver another electrical spike from the computer because the electrical spikes from the heart may be too slow or too irregular. And if we do an electrical tracing, an electrocardiogram from the heart, what we can see is that the pacemaker can take over 
for the natural uh, electrical activity that's missing from the heart. And here you see this sharp little spike here that's followed by this broader uh, activation of the heart. So these sharp spikes that are denoted with those red arrows are actually called pacemaker spikes. So this in this tracing, the pacemaker is driving the normal electrical activity of the heart at a rate of about 65 beats per minute. So this little battery mini computer can take over the function of the heart entirely and keep the, the heartbeat going in a very normal way. For other folks that have significant irregularity of the heart and lots of or a tendency for the heart to go very haywire, very irregular, for the ventricles to go uh, awry in a dangerous way. Well, a more souped up um, um, battery computer can be put in. And in this case, this is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So battery with a mini computer, wires that go down to the heart, very similar to the pacemaker, but in this case, this computer is even smarter and can detect if the heartbeat uh, has gone completely out of whack. In this case, this is called ventricular fibrillation. And if the computer sees that this has gone on for a few seconds, it has the ability to read it and then deliver a powerful shock down these wires to reset the heart and come back to this normal rhythm. You can see that there is a clear distinction between regular sinus uh, activity of the heartbeat versus this really wide, bizarre kind of rhythm of the heart that is not good. This is good. And the way to get from not good to good is to deliver a defibrillation shock uh, using one of these devices. So these are modern ways of dealing with irregularities of the heartbeat. Turning now to the valvular heart system, um, again, for orientation, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And the way that these chambers are separated are by these valves. There are four major valves in the heart. The tricuspid valve separates right atrium from right ventricle. Right ventricle into the pulmonary uh, artery is separated by the pulmonic vein left atrium to left ventricle is separated by the mitral valve, left ventricle out to the aorta is separated by the aortic valve. And when the valve is functioning very well, blood flows in only one direction. So if we see here, looking at the left side of the heart, blood enters into the left atrium, is held there for about a second, and then the, the mitral valve will open up in response to that nicely coordinated electrical system. The mitral valve opens up, blood flows into the left ventricle, and then the valve shuts. Um, and then the blood is pulled into the left ventricle and then is pushed away uh, into the body. And it only goes in one direction, ideally. However, things can go wrong with the valves as they can with the rest of the heart over time or with conditions that may occur uh, through our lifetime. Normally, if we focus on this valve here called the aort aortic valve that separates the left ventricle into the aorta, when the valve opens up nicely and blood is flowing out of the left ventricle, you can see it's nicely opened up here. When it's closed, these three leaf leaflets come very nicely, uh, tightly opposed to each other. And then that's the way that blood flow is controlled. For some people, because of accumulated damage to the uh, uh, valve, uh, the aortic valve, or in deposition of calcium over years and years and years, the valve can become thickened. So now it becomes this more of a triangular shape that. Um, in the open state really doesn't open as nicely as it should. So there is restriction of blood flow from the left ventricle to the aorta. There just isn't enough pump uh, blood flow that can transit out of there. And then in a closed state, you'll see that it is quite uh, thickened and irregular and 
um, and over thickened. So this stenosis uh, creates a restriction of blood flow that can be experienced as tightness in our chest. It may uh, feel like um, um, shortness of breath. It may feel like uh, lack of energy because we're unable to uh, keep up with the blood flow demands of, of the heart. On the other hand, uh, what may also happen with these blood uh, valves or these heart valves is that um, instead of having a normal, nice, uh, uh, tight um, apposition of the, of the valves, they may get kind of loose and wonky and, and not uh, close appropriately. So we can get regurgitation or leaky valves. So blood now goes in the wrong direction. In either of these sort of situations, whether we have a stenotic restricted valve or a leaky uh, valve, you know, think of this like a door that just won't open properly in your house or here a window that has leaks and then the wind will whip through. You know, both of these situations are not nice. They create extra demand, extra pressure in our hearts. So we may need an approach to fix and tighten up these valves. One approach uh, that's kind of classical is that we can actually replace the valve through a surgical approach. And if you'll follow this uh, kind of cartoon in order, so number one, to replace a tight aortic valve, some people may go through an open heart surgery. That will involve uh, doing a, an incision in the middle of the chest through the breastbone of the sternum to open it up and expose the heart. And then there's an incision that is made uh, near the bottom of the aorta to open things up. And here you can see from the top downward that aortic valve, it's meant to be a nice open triangle, but in this cartoon, you can see that there is a lot of calcium buildup that restricts the ability of the aortic valve to open up. Here you'll see that once that is exposed, the surgeon can make an incision all the way around the, the edge of the aortic valve and really, and, and just remove it completely. So now there's a large opening there that will now be replaced with an artificial valve that can be made out of tissue or can be made out of metal and fabric. And then that will be sewn tightly into place in that uh, existing ring structure of the aortic valve. So all of this will be elegantly put into back to place. Toronto has some of the best heart valve surgeons in the world. And, and many of these operations are done every year to replace these aortic valves. And um, you know, one can have a very long lasting, excellent outcome that will now have a new valve that will open and close in an unrestricted way. Another approach to these valves, instead of doing an open heart procedure and exposing the valve entirely, is to do an approach through a, uh, a catheter um, that's put in through the major arteries of the blood uh, of the body. And in this case, there is a wire catheter that might be put in at the level of the groin uh, that is then thread up all the way to that level of the aortic valve narrowing. Here we're seeing a wire that crosses over the valve. And then this catheter with a balloon is advanced into place. Once it's in the exact right position, the, uh, the cardiologist or surgeon can then inflate the balloon that has the valve, uh, the new artificial valve um, uh, in that uh, position as well. The balloon will stretch the, um, the valve into place and then the entire wire catheter balloon are removed and then this new valve is left in place. So it's kind of a new valve inside of the old valve and the opening has been stretched out. Um, so here, what, what happens is a very nice result. It's a little bit smaller than one might get with actually the open heart surgical procedure where the, the old valve has been entirely removed, 
but it creates a very nice new situation where now blood will flow across this valve. It'll open and close very, very nicely. And this, the advantage of this kind of procedure is that it doesn't involve the whole open heart approach to this. Uh, so many people are undergoing this new transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR or TAVI, if you think of a transcatheter aortic valve implant. Okay, moving on to the fourth abnormality of the heart, uh, the so-called cardiomyopathy or a pump problem. We're coming back to this very familiar diagram to you of the different chambers of the heart. And now we'd like to focus on the pumping chamber, in particular, the left ventricle here. And here, what we're trying to represent is a nice, um, compact, streamlined uh, uh, chamber of the heart. And that's the way the heart works best. It is a nice streamlined organ that's meant to beat the 25,000 or 100,000 times per day. In this case, what this cartoon shows you is that the, the ventricle has now been stretched open. The walls of the ventricle are thinner than they used to be. Um, the result, uh, or this may result from uh, long-standing stress on the heart, like high blood pressure, or it may result from a major heart attack that has damaged the walls of the artery, or it may result in some cases from unusual viral effect infections that have attacked the heart, or in some cases, certain medicines that may damage the heart muscle. So th there's a number of things that can happen that will lead to this stretching and thinning of the heart that results in a condition called cardiomyopathy or a clinical syndrome called heart failure. The result of this is the heart is unable to pump in the way that it used to um, uh, do when it used to be in its streamlined state. We don't get good blood flow. We don't get good oxygen delivery to the body. And as a result, um, the, uh, uh, the person will feel tired and shortness and short of breath and may experience other fluid overload kinds of problems. So there are medication approaches that we've described before, such as slowing down and relaxing the heart <coughs> by using medicines like the beta blockers, the LOL drugs. We may try to reduce stress and resistance in the blood vessels by using ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptors receptor blockers, the prills and the sartans. And we also may use medicines to reduce the amount of salt and water in the body, so-called water pills or diuretics. Um, and for many people, these approaches and combinations of these will allow for improved functioning, improved symptoms and reduction in bad things happening like hospitalizations or even death. Um, that's very nice. In very advanced states, we may need to think about alternate types of, uh, of assistance. And just like we think about medicines and surgeries, in heart failure, there may also be um, other interventions that can be offered down the road. And here is one example of a mechanical assist that can be offered in the setting of very advanced heart failure. And this is something called a left ventricular assistance device or a pump that can be um, inserted into the heart and, and think of it as uh, a, a, a way of uh, increasing blood flow out of the heart and into the rest of the body. Uh, so blood can be drawn directly from the heart chamber, transferred right into uh, the, the uh, aorta, and so that there's now a continuous flow of oxygen-rich blood that goes through the body. Um, this, of course, requires a substantial power source, so this individual will need to carry uh, a couple of batteries at all times so that the pump is is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and some people may live with these devices over an extended period of time. Some people may live with these devices until a new heart and a transplant uh, procedure is done uh, to replace this pump uh, mechanism entirely. 
Okay, we've covered a lot of ground in today's session. We've talked about the various systems of the heart that can include a blood supply, electrical system, valves, and muscle and pumps. And we've also described that there may be abnormalities that occur in each of these systems the, and the approaches then that can um, help remedy some of these situations using, quote, lifestyle interventions, medication approaches, and then procedures and interventions that can help us out. We propose that by the end of the session that you would know about these things, and I hope that we've been able to satisfy these objectives of understanding how a healthy heart works with these four systems, describing what can go wrong with the systems of the heart, and the interventions to try and correct some of these problems. Now is your opportunity to ask any questions that you might have, and I'll just pause for just a, 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 a few moments and I will understand completely if there might not be any questions in the moment. And I don't see that there are any. So let me just move on then, uh, but invite you of course to propose any questions at any time to your cardiac rehab team and uh, team members can pull others in, myself included, to address your own individual questions at any time. We wanted to uh, remind you that um, the Healthy University, the Cardiac College and the Diabetes College are now uh, um, leverage, leveraging social media platforms. So here are our Twitter handles and ways that you can uh, hear about updates uh, about uh, the program and educational endeavors. Uh, so please do uh, sign up and follow us. Uh, here's a reminder that we'll be doing a session about diabetes medication. Um, yours truly will be um, facilitating that session uh, next week on Tuesday at 2 p.m. And you will, would all be welcome to join us for that conversation. Um, this brings us to the end of today. And I thank you for joining us, watching either live uh, or uh, on your own. And we hope that these uh, educational endeavors are uh, of interest and value to you. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, and uh, have a great day.